Hello everybody, this is the first video out of three for chapter six of the statistical learning course. So the purpose of this uh, chapter or the set of slides is to present decision uh, tree models. So uh, decision tree are uh, mo like prediction models where uh, uh, on each branch of the tree we make decisions so as to improve our classification. So we'll study that in this chapter. And then once we've uh, studied individual decision trees, we will consider other techniques that can be um, used to improve the performance of regular trees, such as bagging, random forests, or boosting. Okay, so please note that, for example, bagging and boosting are, app, are uh, methods that can be out, used for other models that decision trees, but they fit very well within the context of decision trees. So we'll introduce these approaches in this chapter. So the chapter presents parts of chapter eight from the ISL textbook or chapters nine and eight from the more advanced ESL textbook. So the idea about decision trees involves stratifying or segmenting the predictor space into a number of simple subregions. And then uh, for all observations whose predictors fall in, within the same subregion, they will be assigned the same uh, prediction, which is typically, uh, if, if we're in a regression setting, the prediction for a given area uh, of the, the predictor space is the average of all responses for observations whose predictor fall in this area. Conversely, if we are in a classification setting instead of a regression setting, instead of averaging responses of observations falling in this area, we'll consider the mode of the observations falling in this area. So the mode is the, uh, the, the class which is most often encountered. Uh, the main advantage, well, the main one of the very uh, important advantages of tree-based methods is that they are extremely simple and useful for interpretation. And this applies to standalone trees. Okay, we will see uh, approaches uh, subsequently to combine various trees, which are maybe less simple and less uh, interpretable. But if we use a single decision tree to make predictions, it's uh, very intuitive and very interpretable. So as we just discussed, decision trees can be used either in a regression context or a classification context, which is good. So, uh, if we take single decision trees, which we will introduce first, they're typically not competitive with the best supervi supervised learning approaches we've seen earlier. Okay, so if you want to build a state of the art prediction model, using a single tree typically isn't very, very strong. However, later in the chapter, we, as we just discussed, we will learn how to combine outputs of several decision trees so as to come up with new predictions and these new prediction approaches, these new predictions combining many, many trees uh, can be much more competitive with the other uh, state-of-the-art approaches we've studied. So the, these approaches, as we said, to combine trees, bagging, random forests, boosting, will be introduced uh, later in the chapter. To introduce decision trees, we'll start with a very simple example drawn from the ISL textbook. So this uh, example uses the headers data set that can be loaded in the R software. So I think, uh, I forgot, I didn't verify, but I think the headers uh, data set might be part of the ISL package associated with the textbook. Okay, but for, for this, uh, this data set, we have uh, various data on several baseball players. So one of the variables in the data set is the salary of a player, 
which we would like to predict. So we'll consider as the response variable the following response. So instead of taking directly the salary, we'll uh, do some normalization of the, the random variable. So we'll divide by a thousand and we'll take the log. Now the predictors that we'll will consider to try to predict the salary of a baseball player uh, are twofold. We will first use the number of years the player played uh, up to, to now in the league. And second, hits is the number of hits in previous years. Okay, so we can expect that if somebody has played uh, longer, has more experience, and has more hits, he, he should earn a higher salary. Okay, so that not might not be entirely true because when you play uh, professional sports, you peak at some age and eventually the salary starts decreasing. But the the end of care like the salary of more experienced players is typically higher than the salary of more junior players. So a very simple decision tree is uh, is uh, provided to uh, try to forecast the, uh, the the salary of a player. And here's the illustration of the decision tree that is considered. So basically, to make the prediction, uh, first, we can check if the number of years, so the years predictor is smaller than 4.5. If, if it's smaller than 4.5, then we predict the target as 0.11. Conversely, if the number of years the player has played is greater than 4.5, then you go in this branch, you check the number of hits. If it's smaller than 117.5, well, the, then you would get you would um, predict 6. And here, if it's greater than this, you would predict 6.74. So we see here how the decision tree works. It takes the predictor space. Okay, so here you have the two explanatory variables, years, which go from 1 to 24 in the data set, and hits, which go from 1 to 2038 in the data set. And then basically this predictor space is split into subregions, R1, R2, and R3. And then for all the points within a subregion, the same prediction is applied. Okay, so for instance, if we uh, look at this, then let's go back to the tree to try to interpret this. So if the number of years is smaller than 4.5, we predict 5.11. Okay, so here, years, 4.5. So all players in region R1 have a predicted value of 5.11. Conversely, if it's not the case, so if the number of years is greater than 4.5, then you're in this area here to the right of this particular curve. We can look at hits. If it's smaller than 117.5, so if we're in region R2, then we make the prediction 6. If we're in the region R3, where the number of hits is greater than 117.5, then we predict 6.74. So all uh, players in region R R3 have a predicted uh, normalized salary of 6.74. 74. Okay, so it, we see it's very easy to interpret. So every time there's a, a split in the decision tree, it then tells splitting the predictor space. And then you uh, every time there's a new uh, decision here, there's one more split make made in the predictor space. And then for each of these subregions, uh, the, the, the prediction is constant within the region. So this is an example of model. Now the question we have to ask is how do we come up with number, uh, these numbers? So how the 4.5 and the 117 were selected and um, to, to, so as to decide on how to split the predictor space. And this is what we're going to discuss next. So before continuing, we want to introduce a bit of terminology about decision trees. So the, all the subregions, R1, R2, and R3, they are, known, they are known as either terminal nodes or leaves of the tree. Okay, so here, all the subregions, they correspond to an endpoint here. So this is why we call them leaves or terminal nodes. It's the, the points 
at the end of the tree. Points along the tree where the predictor space is split are referred to as internal nodes. So if we go back here, what are the internal nodes? There are two of them. So this is the first internal node where there's a split. And here, this is the second internal node where, where there is a split. The segments of trees that connect the nodes are called branches. So if we go back here, so this is a branch, this is a branch, this is a branch, and this is a branch. So branches are segments which connects, can connect the uh, nodes together. Okay, so uh, to, to summarize what happens, when we want to make uh, to fit a decision tree to make predictions, we need the following steps. So first, the first step is to try to divide the predictor space. And by predictor space, it's the set of all possible value for each predictors x1 until xp. So let's uh, divide the predictor space into capital J distinct and non-overlapping regions. And then for every observations falling into some region RJ, the same prediction is made, okay? So how, how is that prediction obtained? As we said, it's often through the mean of the observations within that region or the mode. Okay, so for example, uh, if we go back here, let's say we wanted to uh, come up with that prediction 5.11 for all observations in region R1. Well, probably what was done is for all these observations here falling in this region, uh, basically we took their targets, we averaged their targets, or when I say targets, I, I mean response. So we averaged their response and the average response was 5.11. So this is how we came up with a prediction for that region. Okay, so now uh, the first question is how do we divide the predictor space into capital J uh, subregions? Because there, there's an infinite number of ways we could do that. So these subregions could have in theory any shape. But uh, here what we will do for decision trees is we will not consider any possible shape. We'll choose to divide the predictor space into multi-dimensional uh, either call it rectangles or boxes. Okay, so we will not consider any possible shape. We'll consider fixed shape. Well, not fixed shape, but only certain shapes which are boxes or multi-dimensional rectangles. Okay, so this is for reasons of simplicity and ease of interpretation. Okay, so when you, we use boxes, we uh, will see that the, our prediction model can have a tree graphical re representation as we did here. Okay, so this this predictor, when the regions are split in boxes, we can express it as a tree like this. Okay, so what do we mean by boxes or uh, rectangles? It, we uh, mean, so again, this figure is taken from the textbook. Thanks again for the authors for uh, authorizing us to use these. So. When, what we meant by boxes is the following. So on this side, this is not a partition of the predictor space we will be able to attain with decision trees. Why is that the case? It's because this this region here, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll draw it. So uh, this region here, here, it's not a rectangle, okay? So here we see that the, the, the rectangle is somewhat cut here. So this is not something we can come up with uh, when we apply decision tree models. Whereas here on the right side, when we, we, we consider uh, this segmentation of the predictor space, this is something that we can attain through decision trees because we see that all, all such regions take the form or the shape of a rectangle. Okay, so uh, we, we will split the predictor spaces, uh, the predictor space into rectangles, but we must decide how to do that in practice. Okay, so there might be many ways to do that. And the idea is we will try to find the segmentation, which will, uh, ma um, sorry, uh, optimize some objective function. So again, for uh, in a regression setting, 
the typical objective function to be minimized is the uh, called RSS or sum of squared errors. Okay, so the sum of squared errors is simply the sum across all regions of the, the all boxes of the sum across each observation within the box. So within the box means that their predictor, the predictor of observation I falls into the jth box of the response for the observation I minus its associated prediction, which is the prediction for the box J. And we square this difference because this is the prediction error and this is the sum of squared prediction errors. Okay, so once again, uh, the idea is to minimize uh, the, the, the sum of squared error uh, or sum of squared prediction errors for all observations in our training data set. Okay, so we want to find a suitable partition of the predictor space R1 until Rj, uh, which uses boxes exclusively and which produces a small sum of prediction errors. So now one, one issue is that if we would want to consider every single possible partition of the feature space into J boxes, it would be simply computationally uh, unfeasible, okay? especially if the, the, the data set is large, it, it wouldn't work. Okay, so for this reason, instead of considering all possible partitions, we will see a, a method or an algorithm to uh, try to come up with, instead of the optimal one, simply a suitable one. Okay, and this approach to try to find a suitable partition uh, that we will study is called recursive binary splitting. Okay, so there might be other algorithms to train decision trees, but for uh, this chapter here, we'll focus on this approach here, Recur recursive binary splitting. So recursive binary splitting is, is said to be a top-down greedy approach. So what do we mean by top-down? We, we mean that at the initiation of the algorithm, there's a single region containing all observations, and then gradually this uh, single region will, would be uh, separated into smaller subregions. Okay, so we start with a single subregion and then split progressively into smaller subregions. And the word greedy means that each, at each step, so every time we make a, an additional split of the predictor space, the split is made uh, to reduce as much as possible the sum of squared error at the next split or at the current split. And uh, we do not look ahead to make a split or a move, I'll call it a split, which will be worthwhile in a few additional uh, steps or iterations. Every time we make a split, it's because we want to optimize as much as possible the reduction in sum of square errors for the for this single split we are making. Okay, so this is why we say we are greeting, uh, greedy. We're not uh, looking far ahead in the future to make our optimization. Every time we make a split, we want to improve the performance as much as possible right now for this current split. So uh, we will now explain how recursive binary splitting works. So the for when whenever we have, um, we apply binary recursive splitting, we have to, so let's say we have one single region, one box. Uh, what we need to do is to de de determine first, uh, across which, well, which variable are we going to use to split? So are we going to split, let's say we have two predictors, are we going to split horizontally uh, or vertically? Sorry, sorry, vertically or horizontally? Okay, so are we going to use predictor x1 to split or are we going to use predictor x2? And at the same time, if we choose predictor X1, we'd like to know uh, what's gonna be the threshold for splitting. Okay, so do we 
uh, split for all observations smaller than 1, smaller than 2, smaller than 6, smaller than 10. So this is something to be determined. Okay, so whenever we have a region and we split that region, so when I say region, I mean the box within the predictor space, that region is split into two regions. The first one being um, denoted by R1JS and the second one being denoted by uh, R2JS. So here, R1JS means the second, uh, sorry, the first sub region of the original region if we split with respect to predictor J and if the threshold for splitting is equal to s. Okay, so R1 means this the set of all predictors within our region for which the jth predictor is smaller than s, and R2 is the sum, that's not the sum, the set of all uh, predictor values within the regions uh, region for which xj, the jth predictor, is greater or equal to s. So when we have a region and some points, we'd like to find the best split, and by split, it's the combination of J and S, so choice of predictor and threshold, which would lead to the greatest possible reduction in uh, the sum of squared errors, which is uh, to minimize the sum of square errors into the two subregions. Okay, so the, the sum of square errors in the first subregion is this, the sum across all observations in subregion one of the response minus the prediction for subregion one plus the sum across all observations falling into the subregion two of the response uh, for the, the, that observation minus the predicted value for some region two square. Okay, so this is the uh, sum of square errors once we've made our split and we want to find the split so combination of j and s which yields the smaller uh, sum of square errors after we've split some region okay so how does a recursive binary splitting work so we start with a single region and then we split it into two and then what's going to happen is all the subregions are split until some stopping criterion is met. Okay, so let's say we can split the first into two. So then we would take the first one and try to split it again and then take the subset of the, the splits of the first one and split them again. So you continue like this until uh, some, some criterion, stopping criterion is reached. Okay, so when you read the, when the stopping criterion is met, then you st stop splitting the various subregions and your model uh, training is completed. Okay, so every time you have a subregion, as we said, the split is done by identifying which is, which is the J over which we're going to make the splitting. So for which predictor XJ are we going to split? And what's our either threshold or, or cutoff point S over which we're going to split? Okay, so um, again, the subregion can be, so whenever we have not only a, the original region, but any subregion in the tree, we can continue uh, subdividing that region, subregion R, into two. So the first is all uh, points in R for which the jth predictor is smaller than S, and conversely, R points in the subregion R for which the jth predictor is greater or equal to S. Okay, as we said, so we continue splitting all the various subregions in the tree until a stopping criterion is met. So what's a suitable stopping criterion? Well, there can be many possible criteria which can be used, but a common example would be to stop whenever a region contains no more than five observations. Okay, so if a subregion contains one, th two, three, or four observations, then we won't uh, split it. Uh, we won't split it anymore. Okay, so why do we need a stopping criterion? It's because if we uh, continue splitting forever, eventually the tree 
would have exactly small n subregions, so as many subregions as observations. So, uh, and each subregion which have exactly one observation, the prediction would be exactly equal to the response of that observation, which would mean that in sample, the training error would be exactly zero, which would be clearly overfitting. Okay, so we don't want to have n subregions, as many subregions as the number of observations. For each subregion, uh, when the model is trained, we must have at least a few observations in each subregion. Okay, so for this reason, having an early stopping criterion is necessary. Okay. However, it has been noticed, so a lot of people has, have trained these models and people have noticed that even when using an early stopping criterion uh, as the one proposed previously, the resulting tree often produces some overfitting. Okay, so even if we say we stop when the, 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 there's only five observations in, the, in, a given, in all given or less in all given regions, the tree might still end up being too complex and lead to overfitting. So too complex in the sense that prediction variances are, are very high despite the low bias of the model. Okay, so the idea is uh, instead of having this very complex tree with a very large number of uh, branches and terminal nodes, sometimes it's better to have a more uh, simple and smaller tree with less branches and this smaller tree would produce less variance because you don't necessarily try to exactly fit each observation and not only has it lower variance it often has better interpretation and sometimes at the cost of only little bias. So when, th when that's the case smaller trees can provide better predictions in terms of MSC for new observations if they have lower variance and if the variance is reduced more than the bias is increased. Okay, so what can we do uh, to, to have a tree that is less complex and might not have as many branches? One pos possibility that is alternative to the pr uh, prior criterion, so the, the previous criterion was ha to have at maximum five observations in each uh, each uh, final subregion or each leaf of the tree. Another possibility, second uh, criterion, could be to continue splitting until the the decrease in sum of squared errors due to each split exceeds some threshold that is reasonably large. Okay, so let's say we could say we'll continue splitting every time the split reduces the uh, mean the sum of squared error by 17 and once uh, there's no possible split which reduces the, uh, the, the the sum of square errors by more than 17 units then we'll, we'll just stop splitting okay and we want the 17 or the threshold to be quite large because if it's too low then there will be too many splits However, uh, that strategy uh, can have unfavorable outcomes due to the following reason. Okay, so we said that we follow a, a greedy approach, so a top-down greedy algorithm with binary recursive splitting. So because it's greedy, the strategy we pursued just suggested earlier might be short-sighted. Okay, so the reason is if we split only if the performance is increased by an amount s, then there are situations where some splits in the tree might have a very little value in themselves, but these splits allow making new splits later on, which then have a much uh, higher impact in, in prediction accuracy and lead to much larger re reduction in the sum of squared errors. Okay, so because of this short-sightedness of the recursive binary splitting, if we only allow splits um, increasing the performance by a second threshold, this might not be appropriate under some circumstances. 
So a typical approach consists in what we call pruning the tree. Okay, so a better strategy in practice can sometimes consist of building a very large tree T0, which is very complex and which has many, many branches. And then at the end, once the tree has grown very complex with many branches, we will prune the tree. And what we mean by prune the tree, we mean cutting branches of the trees. And by cutting branches of the tree, what we mean is regrouping subregions together until some criterion is met. So to, to prove the tree, there are uh, various ways this can be done. What we will consider next is an approach called cost complexity pruning to prune the tree. Okay, so pruning means cutting branches of the tree or um, uh, alternatively, we mean that we regroup the subregions together. Okay, so if we, we grow a very large tree, it means that we split the total region into many, many, many subregions, but then at the end, we start regrouping some of them if the, split, the splits are not very good. So uh, the cost complexity pruning approaches or approach involves identifying a subtree T of T0, which minimizes the following objective function. So the objective function is uh, the sum across all leaves of the new tree or of the subtree uh, of the sum across all observations into each leaf of the squared prediction error plus alpha times the, here th this notation me, uh, is used to represent the number of leaves or subregions of the subtree. So basically, this objective function uh, says that when we have an original tree, very large tree T0, we'll try to remove branches so as to minimize the, the following quantity. So minimizing the sum of squared error entails maximizing the accuracy of the predictions. But minimizing here the number of leaves or the, uh, the to total number of subregions uh, in, uh, or boxes in the final model entails favoring parsimony or having a, a, a tree with limited complexity. Okay, so here we see that minimizing this objective function entails uh, finding a suitable trade-off between accuracy of our decision tree and parsimony. And to favoring parsimony allows having simpler models with smaller variants which could uh, be helpful in the bias variance trade-off uh, to improve predictions. And here, once again, alpha is a tuning parameter. So exactly as we did for other regression methods, so for example, the, the weight of the penalty in lasso or ridge, or um, the number of predictors you can keep in a regression setting or something like that, this lambda is typically something you train tr through cross-validation of or out-of-sample performance assessment. Okay, so now we have a big tree T0 that we, we uh, trained initially, and then we want to find a subtree, uh, capital T, which solves this objective function. Now, how to do that? This might be a bit uh, complicated, so we'll keep that out of scope, but for interested people, please refer to page 308 of the ESL textbook for more indications uh, and they, they, they explain how in practice weakest uh, link pruning, so weakest link pruning, sorry, okay, so, sorry, weakest link pruning is a, a method to try to solve the com cost complexity pruning here. Okay, so minimizing this is called cost complexity pruning and weakest link pruning is an algorithm proposed in the ES ESL textbook to tackle this kind of problem. Okay, so how to do that in practice, we'll leave this aside for the, the sake of lack of time. But for interested people, please refer to this page of the ESL textbook, which provides uh, details about a method allowing to tackle these problems. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, cost complexity pruning is similar to other uh, 
shrinkage methods such as ridge regression or a lasso because it's, it uh, involves adding uh, to the objective function a penalty term which penalizes the complexity of the model. So this is done in order to attempt striking a suitable trade-off between the complexity of the model and the training accuracy of the model. So reducing the complexity is meant to reduce the outcome of overfitting the training model and having poor out-of-sample prediction. So as we said, the parameter alpha, uh, which uh, weights the penalty, can be selected through cross-validation or out-of-sample performance assessment. So here we've discussed the classification trees. We've met, we've used the objective function, which are uh, sum of squared errors. So we, we've considered uh, regression trees when we mentioned the objective function. So in the next lecture, we'll discuss classification trees, but we'll stop the lecture right now. All right, so take care. Have a nice day.